Greetings from Chicago. This is Karen Anderson, healthcare strategist at Morningstar. Welcome to our session at the Morningstar Individual Investor Conference Australia, focused on COVID-19 treatment and vaccine progress. So as you know, this is a, a very rapidly evolving space. Uh, the goal of this presentation is really to go over our view of the, the branded drug industry right now, uh, progress that we've been making with, uh, with treatments, and the kind of the timeline we see uh, in the evolution of the size of a potential vaccine market as we head into 2021. So first of all, just very quickly to go over a little bit of background here, I wanted to spend a minute talking about our view on the branded drug industry right now and putting COVID into uh, context a little bit. So the industry does look slightly undervalued to us. Uh, pricing and potential US policy changes around this are still weighing on the industry. But at the same time, we still see a few positive paradigm shifts that are going on here in the industry I wanted to mention. So um, first of all, um, you know, R&D shifts. Um, you know, we have been seeing a lot of the large firms moving um, away from primary care and into these niche areas where they do have stronger pricing power and are able to get faster approval in these areas where there's typically significant unmet need with patients. And the FDA, in response to this, um, this kind of innovative R&D coming out of these companies, uh, has been willing to uh, rapidly approve these therapies. So, so typically, the you know the time that these drugs are are in development has been shrinking. Uh, we've seen this go from, you know, typically it could be for a standard drug a year. We've seen this go down to you know maybe six months for a priority review, and even less, maybe two or three months for some of the highest priority programs. And then another another key area here is really the progress with um, different types of new therapies that are being released. We've seen just in the past few years uh, several innovative immuno oncology drugs. So these are you know oncology therapies that are really kind of helping the immune system better fight uh, cancer. And we've also seen cell therapies, uh, so taking patients' own cells and modifying them to fight the cancer, uh, gene therapy to try to um, you know correct um, potentially uh, genetic. Uh, mutations that patients may have had from birth leading to different rare diseases. So we've just seen a, a lot of progress in, in a lot of these areas. And the headwinds, I would say, uh, overall uh, look manageable to us. On policy, um, we do see more moderate changes to pricing as the most likely to be implemented um, rather than more extreme change like uh, international price benchmarking or, or Medicare for all. And pressure in terms of uh, pressure from COVID-19 on existing drugs, um, also manageable. Uh, we're seeing significant recovery for uh, sales of hospital administered drugs um, in the third quarter starting to read out for, for some of the companies we cover. And then also on the COVID pipeline, you know, this started with uh, Gilead's uh, Remdesivir, uh, also known as Vicluri, uh, with their emergency use authorization in May. Um, you know, we're, we're starting to see wider access for patients, more access to that drug, and hopefully um, a move to uh, availability of um, more drugs. So uh, repurposed immunology drugs, uh, targeted antibody therapies, and then vaccines uh, very late this year, uh, which I'm gonna dive into um, in more detail later in the presentation. So here, this just, um, you know, as I said, the, the industry does look slightly undervalued to us versus a, a mostly fairly valued overall market. So, so this graph is a, a 10 year history of valuation and multiples for uh, large cap branded drug stocks in our coverage, uh, comparing them to the overall market. So at the bottom, you can see the industry, um, the drug industry in blue has mostly stayed below a price to fair value ratio of one, meaning it's mostly stayed undervalued this year. Um, in contrast, you know, we saw a brief dip to undervaluation for the entire overall market earlier this year that's shown in orange, uh, but the overall market now looks mostly fairly valued to us. And then on the top half, you can see in blue, these are the, um, uh, price to earnings multiples um, for the ind drug industry, those uh, remain compressed relative to the, the orange line that's representing the overall market. So this discount on multiples, you can see if you look back, this really kind of started back in 
mid 2015. That was around the time that pricing pressure on drugs was um, really first um, discussed on kind of a higher level through uh, Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. And here just, you know, Morningstar, you may be familiar, Morningstar, we're very um, focused on through the lens of moats. Uh, we're really looking at sustainable ad competitive advantages. So most of the companies we cover in the large cap branded drug space have wide moats. And what we is see is sustainable competitive advantages and ROICs that exceed cost of capital for the next couple of decades. And that's due to the, the innovation that I talked about that, that's continuing um, despite headwinds uh, like potential pricing pressure. And here kind of moving into moving into the COVID analysis, a lot of detail in this slide that I'm, I'm not gonna go through every number, um, but this slide does give a historical view of what we've seen uh, on a monthly basis for uh, cases, tests, and deaths in the US uh, going through September and our forecast for the, the final quarter of the year. So as you know, the, the US um, never really managed to contain coronavirus unlike many other countries um, in Europe, um, Asia, who at least had much lower levels um, during the, the early summer months uh, for a few reasons. So, you know, a lot of these struggles, um, many countries are going through. In the US, we, we really have underinvested in public health for several decades. Uh, masking has also become a very political issue. So, uh, you know, the number I've seen quoted uh, by, um, members of uh, Health and Human Services, the government has been somewhere around 50% compliance for the public uh, with masking. Um, and that can vary from, it could be 80 to 90% in some um, areas and close to no masking um, in others. So um, with social distancing, I think we've seen more success, but you know, early on there were issues with trying to reopen restaurants and bars too early. And now we're entering the fall and we're dealing with, you know, people meeting more in enclosed spaces, uh, as well as some schools and, and universities uh, returning to the classroom. Diagnostics has been a, an entirely other issue with uh, problems with uh, shortages of supplies, tests, um, inaccurate results, um, not enough platforms um, to match the tests that are available, um, and also significant delays in results. So instead of having to wait, you know, ideally, a, you know, couple of days, uh, sometimes patients, patients have been waiting a week or two, uh, and that really makes the results a lot less useful uh, for them and also for, for contact tracing, so for uh, avoiding their uh, spread to, to others. Um, and we've even had um, issues with um, tracking data and making sure the samples are being sent to, to labs that, that actually have capacity to do the testing. Uh, we do expect to see significant improvements uh, this quarter in supply, and that could help students and workers uh, returning to school and office uh, more uh, safely. And I'll talk more about that on the next slide. Uh, contact tracing, I mentioned um, a lot of problems related to diagnostics here, but but also a lack of funding uh, and just, you know, in, in many countries, just too many cases um, to really make this work. And uh, to be fair, we're, we are up against a very tough target uh, in the sense that 40% of cases are asymptomatic, um, but still likely contagious. So that makes it really tough to get everyone uh, diagnosed and quarantined that need to be. But overall, you know, our latest estimates in the U.S., uh, assumes uh, 287,000 deaths and about 20% of the population having been infected over the course of this year, um, which generally implies um, increased infection rates as we go forward, uh, but slightly lower death rates. So in our forecast, uh, you can see new cases increasing after a slight dip in September. So on the plus side, we've had improvements in diagnostics, uh, better management of hygiene, um, infected individuals are also tending to be younger now, uh, which is likely to uh, further drive down that fatality rate. Uh, we also have had progress with treatments and vaccines, uh, but these, these positives are likely to be countered by the fall season as people spend more time indoors. Um, and we're also seeing a growing proportion of new cases in areas that have lower population density and also among college students. And these are both populations that generally haven't been through um, the same surges in cases that we've seen with the past waves. So they have fewer learnings from past outbreaks or tend to be less concerned about um, the ramifications of an infection in the case of the younger populations. 
So other countries are also seeing uh, increases in cases as fall begins. And really the only way to, to put an end to this is through immunity. And that immunity can either come from infections or from vaccinations. So vaccinations really stand out to us as the, the key catalyst to watch for um, as we begin the effort to return to uh, a more normal life. Now here, this is this is a view um, to give you an idea of what the U.S. testing situation looks like. Um, this testing and diagnosis on a on a daily basis, going back to the, the beginning of the pandemic. So even though testing has increased um, to roughly say 800,000 tests or so a day, um, that has kept that and that has kept a uh, percentage of tests that come back positive in the single digits. This hasn't been enough to contain the pandemic. Um, so diagnoses per day, um, they hit a low in June, around 20,000. Um, and recently we've been increasing um, above the 50,000 uh, level per day. So, so in many developed countries, we've really hit a ceiling on the number of tests we can run with the, the slower but the more accurate PCR method. Uh, so that's uh, where you, you take the genetic material of the virus and you amplify in a lab to find out if a test is positive or negative. Hopefully, um, we see that increase substantially because one thing has actually changed just in the past month. We have two new tests that could significantly affect testing capacity in the US and globally. So both Abbott and Roche uh, will be able to supply tens of millions of new test strips um, each month that are, are cheap and give a relatively accurate answer in roughly 15 minutes. So these tests need to be run by a healthcare professional, but they're a huge benefit given the fact that they don't need any special equipment and you don't have to send them to the lab. So this should help with, um, with testing not only those with symptoms, but also screening uh, students or employees that are returning to school or work. Um, their ultimate impact uh, will really depend on how well they are targeted uh, to the populations that are at higher, highest risk of spreading the virus. Um, Unfortunately, the data on the antigen testing can be difficult to track, so that's not included in some of the, the data from some of the states and their tallies. So here, this just gives you another snapshot um, looking at the states in the US, just to give you an idea of how different, what a spectrum this is in terms of the success level right now uh, for different states against of the virus. And this situation also changes quite rapidly too. Uh, positive test rates are, uh, are too high to suppress the virus in most states. So the Harvard Global Health Institute has estimated that you can stabilize an outbreak at a 10% positive rate, but you need to get down to a 3% rate to be able to contain it. So you can see those states in blue are the ones that have, have reached that level. So there are very few states at that level and the vast majority are either you know, at a stable level or growing. Now here, this is where we get to some of the treatments that we've seen uh, approved or in testing for COVID. So this is an effort to, to summarize them by category and some of the, the advantages and disadvantages of each of them. So first I thought I'd go over generics. So um, steroid dexamethasone, um, that doesn't yet have the, the FDA emergency use authorization, but it generated very positive data in severely ill patients. Um, and it's been strongly recommended by World Health Organization. So the recent study showed a reduction in deaths by 20%, um, and other steroids are, are likely to have a similar benefit too. Uh, the category also includes uh, hydroxychloroquine, uh, which has had this long story of uh, initially promising data uh, with emergency use authorization, and then that emergency use authorization was revoked once we, we got more data and learned that there was really no efficacy benefit, and in fact, there was a, a safety risk from patients taking the, the medicine. So now we're testing uh, interferon, which is a, a drug that um, is used to treat other diseases like multiple sclerosis um, to, to boost the immune system. That's being used in combination with other therapies and testing. Um, all of these therapies overall, I'd say that one of these is, is that they're all, these are all existing drugs, so they're rapidly available. Um, but one of the issues with that is that they're not tailored, so they're, they're not designed to treat COVID-19, and they can have safety issues. So moving to, to antivirals, um, 
these are you know, treatments that actually target the virus itself. So uh, Gilead's remdesivir, uh, that was approved. That's an, an intravenous treatment for hospitalized patients that does have an emergency use authorization. We assume 2 billion in total the drug in 2020. And we see that uh, falling beyond this year though, um, as we see fewer cases, but also as we see more effective treatments um, and vaccines. So the short history on remdesivir is that it's shown um, an ability to improve recovery time by uh, approximately 30%. And there's a trend to improvement in survival in um, a Gilead-sponsored study. Uh, but it, it didn't work as well in patients who are on ventilators, and it, it failed to show um, a substantial benefit on uh, survival in the in a very large recent study done by the World Health Organization. So, so we think remdesivir's activity here is is pretty modest and only in uh, lower risk hospitalized patients. Um, Gilead's hoping to expand um, their use with maybe an inhaled version, testing that now, um, and they're going to have improved supply next year. Uh, but we're really waiting for for more data to see if they could expand use to um, non-hospitalized patients and if they can see better efficacy. Uh, there is an, an oral antiviral, which would be a significant improvement to the intravenous Gilead drug uh, that's being studied by Merck and Ridgeback, which could be a, a potentially strong competitor. So you could treat for both hospitalized and also patients before they get to the point where they need hospitalization. And that's just in the process now of starting uh, two very large phase three studies. Pfizer also has an antiviral that could be used in combination, and that's just starting an early trial too. So overall, I'd say, you know, these are um, antivirals look like a, a promising piece of the puzzle. You could also see combinations between different types of therapies. So antivirals could be one piece of, um, you know, multi-drug regimen. Uh, and then we've also seen for the repurposed immunology drugs, um, we've also seen recent data coming out here. So uh, Lilly's arthritis drug, Illumiant, uh, Roche's arthritis drug, Actemra, um, they could both help really tamp down any kind of overreaction of the immune system, which can be so harmful in patients that have uh, very severe cases. But the efficacy we've seen so far, again, um, kind of similar to, to remdesivir has been pretty modest. You know, we've seen either improvements in uh, keeping patients off of ventilators, uh, but not on death rates or very modest improvements in recovery time. I think, you know, adding Illumiant to remdesivir, uh, you know, gave patients one extra, uh, one day faster in their recovery time. Um, and I think there's there's some evidence that the drugs that help uh, modulate the immune system can help patients based on data from um, uh, the generic steroids, uh, Illumiant and Actemra, but so far, I'd say among these, dexamethasone looks the most promising, both for its its efficacy and obviously for its cost as well. And then finally, here I you know the I'd say turning to antibodies, um, this is really the the type of treatment that I think has by far the most promise among the, among these categories. Um, in practice, we could also see combination here too with with antivirals or with the immune uh, modulators. So the best way to think about antibody treatments is that they're um, directly administering antibodies to the patients rather than with a vaccine. Um, a vaccine pushes a patient to produce their own antibodies. So this is uh, considered a, um, a, a more passive immunization. So, so first, you know, we've seen convalescent plasma being used. That has an emergency use authorization by the FDA. Um, that, that includes a collection of antibodies that patients make as they recover from COVID-19. So you can, you can collect that from a recovered patient and then just give it to a, a current patient. There are no controlled studies showing that this works, um, just, just studies done in, um, uh, without a control arm. Uh, so, but even if it works, um, I'd say the, the, one of the biggest issues here is just that supply is limited. This has to come from plasma from recovered patients and efficacy can really vary. So some samples from recovered patients have a lot of antibodies and some don't. Targeted antibodies really takes the best of convalescent plasma and companies are manufacturing something to mimic this in the lab. So, um, you know, despite the earlier uh, progress we saw from, from Gilead, I think there is higher sales potential for targeted antibodies. There are two programs here that have been filed with the FDA for emergency use. 
uh, from Regeneron, who's getting manufacturing help from Roche, and another program, uh, Lilly, who's getting manufacturing help from Amgen. Uh, both of these would uh, likely be used in patients who are um, higher deemed higher risk. So these are people who either because of their age, their health, um, or by the level of virus they have are, are deemed high risk. Uh, Regeneron just disclosed their first data for their antibody cocktail. So they combined two different antibodies in one regimen, um, and they studied that in non-hospitalized patients. And um, we think that data supports the idea that Regeneron can use a lower dose um, to treat patients who test with really high viral loads, which implies that they're having trouble uh, fighting the virus. Um, they've also partnered with Roche. I think that's very valuable here, both for supply of the antibody and for uh, potential new diagnostics that can help um, better determine whether a patient's high or low viral load. Uh, we think this could have $6 billion in sales potential in 2021, um, assuming similar pricing as remdesivir, around $2,000, uh, but expanded use in 2021 as both a treatment and uh, a prevention for uh, high-risk individuals. And Lilly has also seen data. They saw data in September and, and now in October uh, for one antibody and then also a cocktail approach that they're looking at that's kind of similar to Regeneron's approach. Um, so eventually, you know, they're, they're moving faster with the monotherapy, but eventually they should also have a, a combination regimen to offer. Uh, there's several other programs in development here too. Uh, Veer and Glaxo uh, are, you know, moving into more advanced studies. Um, Astro's moving forward. Uh, they've got an antibody that might be longer acting, um, could, could last for six months or a year. So they're mo more focused on using it as uh, prevention for, for people who, you know, may not be as responsive to, uh, to a vaccine. So, so we're expecting uh, emergency use authorization from the FDA for Lilly and Regeneron's targeted antibodies later this year. But we do see most use in, in 2021 as we're still going to be seeing uh, vaccine supply ramping at that point. And this here, this really kind of summarizes our view of the, the leading vaccines, um, focusing on programs that are um, disclosing data uh, that have strong potential for their technology, and also the ability to supply at least uh, hundreds of millions of people with a vaccine in 2021, if successful. So, so we've assigned um, probabilities of approval to the programs um, that have reported phase one data, um, somewhere between 50 to 70% probabilities. Uh, the first two vaccines, uh, Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech, uh, both in phase three, we think those could receive emergency use authorization by the end of this year. Um, there is an ongoing trial pause for AstraZeneca's phase three that makes it less likely that, that their vaccine um, can hit that mark and see emergency use authorization before 2021. Um, Johnson & Johnson also is on a similar timeline, given its own uh, trial pause as well. So, so maybe just briefly, I'll start there with the safety issues. So we know very little about the, the J&J trial pause. Uh, for AstraZeneca, we know that there was a patient who developed a rare autoimmune reaction, uh, transverse myelitis, um, in the, the UK trial. Um, so this trial... The, the trial in the UK of the AstraZeneca vaccine um, and others in other geographies have started, but the US trial is still on hold. So um, it's, it's a difficult call, I think, even for medical experts to say whether this case is, is related to the vaccine or not. Um, it could be bad luck. It could be triggered by a viral infection. Um, it could be, it could, or it could be related to the vaccine. Um, if there's not, if there is a second case, the odds of this being um, not being related to the vaccine would really drop significantly. I think the U.S. is just being as cautious as possible because we do have other vaccines in late stage development that work in different ways. Um, the, the Astra vaccine and the J&J &J vaccine both work in a similar way uh, using a viral shell to deliver the genetic material for um, uh, the coronavirus spike protein, which is really how the virus gets into cells. Um, and we haven't seen these sorts of side effects um, in, in other trials. 
So the most advanced uh, vaccines, as I mentioned, looking at this kind of going from the top, uh, Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech, these are mRNA vaccines. So the first data from these should be available uh, very soon, likely in November. That partly depends how widespread COVID is in the areas where they're running the phase three studies, uh, whether they see enough diagnosed cases in the placebo arm to draw a conclusion on how effective the vaccine is. So the trials are designed so there's a first look at efficacy that could show positive results if the vaccine is somewhere around 70 to 80 percent effective at preventing uh, patients from becoming infected. And so for reference, the FDA's low bar uh, for considering a vaccine effective is closer to 50 percent. And on safety, the FDA is requiring a median of two months of safety data since the patient's second shot. Uh, which means Pfizer should have enough safety data based on you know, the timing of when they enrolled their phase three study. They should have enough safety data in the second half of November. And I think one of the key reasons the FDA is, is looking at this two month mark for safety data um, is that you know, there's one statistic that's been quoted by um, the head of the Operation Warp Speed in the US, uh, Monsef Slawi, who said that 90% of vaccine adverse events are seen in the first 42 days. So really, I think the FDA is, has the sense that if they can get two months of safety data, that's enough to get this initial emergency use authorization. And then they will continue to follow patients in trials after the emergency use authorization to gather even more safety data. So, so we do expect FDA reviews um, just to take a matter of weeks, uh, allowing the potential first EUA in, in December. So I do, I do often get the question, you know, whether once we have a vaccine, is that going to be enough to push us over into uh, herd immunity, which is, is really, you know, the, the goal to get enough people protected that the vaccine doesn't have enough places to spread and really perpetuate itself. So assuming, if you assume 70% of adults get vaccinated at, and say it's a 70% efficacy rate, that roughly means about half of adults would be protected. Um, but some, some people have already been um, infected with COVID, so they have immunity that way. Or uh, potentially there could be a cross reactivity from other coronaviruses. Uh, so if you add that together with the, the efficacy of the vaccine, uh, we think that should be enough to reach herd immunity. There there's, is controversy over what level that, that, that really is, what level of immunity we need as a society to get herd immunity, but somewhere around 60 to 70% immunity is believed to be high enough. Um, you know, in some countries like the U.S., there's been more skepticism about the, the pace of vaccine development and whether we're, we're rushing a vaccine to market. So, you know, in a more bearish case, if only 50 percent of adults choose to get vaccinated, uh, that would require 100 you percent know, efficacy to the, get to the same herd immunity goal. Um, so there's a, a lot of work to be done, I think, in terms of communicating that phase three data as it comes through, uh, communicating the, the benefits and the risks. Um, to, to increase the, the confidence in the vaccination process here. And, and no matter what, I think there's going to be a, a relatively long transition phase while, while people are getting vaccinated, um, during which we all still need to, to keep up with precautions, um, like, like wearing masks and distancing. So, so talking a little bit through the graphic here, um, you know, we've got different types of vaccines, the RNA programs I mentioned uh, from Moderna and, and Pfizer BioNTech. Um, there are no approved RNA vaccines, and that's probably one of the, the biggest question marks um, with, you know, whether these vaccines would get through safely to the market. Um, but we have seen very solid data from phase one. Uh, they also can be manufactured very rapidly. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges, is, assuming we see positive data, one of the biggest challenges is going to be distribution because these do require um, being frozen for, for most, most of the time. They can be briefly refrigerated. Um, so that does make it a little more challenging. Standard vaccines typically require um, uh, refrigeration instead of freezing. So um, that's an additional logistic hurdle. Um, that makes it probably more likely that these would be better suited for uh, developed markets that have, um, you know, faster distribution that is capable of handling um, dry ice and thermal shippers. Uh, the adenovirus, this is the, the kind of type of uh, vaccine that um, AstraZeneca and J&J I talked about that um, both of these are on trial pauses, but, you know, I think that 
with the J&J study, there's very little known and this likely could be a just a precaution. Um, J&J's technology was actually validated in, a, uh, in Ebola. Um, and one advantage of J&J's vaccine is that it is just one shot. Um, and as I mentioned, logistics is going to be very important here. Um, you know, once we get past that and that hurdle of seeing the phase three data and finding out if these are effective, the next big challenge is going to be distributing this and actually getting it to patients. And seeing a patient once to give them a vaccine is a lot simpler than seeing them once and then scheduling them for another visit and then making sure they're administered and their supply of that exact um, vaccine that they received the first time. Um, so so J&J &J would, you know, assuming they can make it through their, their large phase three study, um, they would have a significant advantage there. And it's also refrigerated as opposed to being frozen. So we do expect large supply of the J&J vaccine uh, in 2021. And then moving really to the, the antigen vaccines. So these, um, there's a lot more experience with this technology. Uh, Novavax has had very strong phase one data and they should be able to produce a large supply because they really don't need as much vaccine for it to be effective. Um, Sanofi, also an antigen vaccine, is on its heels. We haven't seen the, the phase one data there yet, but I think these are these are slower because manufacturing can be a little more difficult, but also, um, you know, there's just a, a lot more experience with these types of vaccines. I'd say on, on efficacy, we've been most impressed with Novavax, um, but, but all of these studies in phase one, you know, they all use different assays and different controls. Um, and of course, we don't have any true efficacy data yet. That will all be in phase three uh, when we see data on the ability of these vaccines to prevent disease rather than just the ability for vaccines to, you know, to induce an antibody response or a T cell response, which are good indicators, but that's, you know, that's really not the, the ultimate endpoint that we're looking at. And then finally, um, you know, all these firms differ on pricing um, than their profit expectations. Uh, so which vaccines succeed and the order they reach the market could have a significant impact on the overall size of the market, whether we see uh, not-for-profit vaccines dominating or for-profit vaccines. So, so just um, trying to put in a number on the size of the COVID-19 vaccine market is, is very difficult at this point. The, the bottom graphic here shows how we arrive at our assumption of a roughly $40 billion market for vaccines in 2021. Um, that, that red box um, is an area that looks most likely to us. That's a range of 20 to 60 billion. Um, and on pricing, we're using an average price right now of uh, per dose of about $14. And that was based on um, the contracts that we've seen signed in the US. So, so on dosing, um, we assume that about half of adults uh, in for-profit markets um, would receive vaccine in 2021. We estimate they would require a little over 3 billion doses. So assuming that you see, you know, of, of those vaccines I listed on the last slide, if you see half of them uh, get to market, um, that gets us north of 40 billion. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty around this number, though, depending on uh, future pricing, um, how many of the not-for-profit vaccines have solid data and strong supply. Uh, but we're assuming that, that most U.S. adults will be vaccinated uh, by the end of the first half of, of 2021. And 17 billion of that market could be for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. Um, but we just to note, we still have that weighted at a 60% probability, probability of approval because we haven't seen any true efficacy data yet, just as I mentioned, the promising antibody data in phase one. And we also don't model any recurring sales year after year for these vaccines either. Uh, we're not assuming that we see um, an endemic virus that will require um, new vaccinations every year. And then finally, on this slide here uh, on valuation. So this is uh, really the landscape of Morningstar's drug firm coverage that has what I would consider significant ties to uh, COVID-19 vaccines or treatment. Uh, there's a range of market caps involved. This goes from um, companies like Johnson & Johnson um, all the way down to um, the RNA vaccine company BioNTech. Uh, so some of the larger firms have maybe gotten less of a market cap bump from their progress with treatments or vaccines. So we still think that you know, companies like Roche, 
like Pfizer and Merck are interesting ways to get get exposure to COVID innovation, um, but without the higher risk involved at firms that are exclusively focused on a, a new COVID vaccine technology like BioNTech. So BioNTech, uh, in contrast, we assign them a, a very high uncertainty rating, uh, partly because of um, the, the level that we've incorporated the vaccine into our, our valuation model. Gilead uh, did receive a, a bump early on, but sentiment has declined since, um, as we've seen, um, you know, progress with vaccines and antibodies, and more disappointing data recently too from some said some studies of remdesivir. But overall, Gilead also looks undervalued to us, just not really on a, a COVID-related basis. And even though vaccines and antibodies, in particular, we see as huge 2021 sales opportunities and obviously even bigger opportunities for society to begin to move past the pandemic, this hasn't had a significant impact on our fair value estimates for the larger uh, firms that are making vaccines. Uh, where valuation really does, um, valuation and mo ratings really rest on long-term cash flows from products that we see continuing to grow um, in the out years of our models uh, for the next 10 years and beyond. And so, so that's all I have. Um, thank you so much for listening. Any advice in this video is general advice prepared by Morningstar without reference to your financial objectives, situation, or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest.